Hello everyone and welcome to Into the Breach 101, a new series in which I help you master the mechanics of Into the Breach. Whether your goal is to achieve 30k perfect victories on hard or simply improve your own play, I hope to guide you in those endeavors. Now note is that I'm not trying to approach the game from the perspective of say mathematics or perfect play. There are some great videos on YouTube that go over whether or not it's a perfect information game and how you can exploit that to your advantage. And if you, you know, post on Reddit, you'll see that there generally are more or less perfect solutions to different puzzles. I'm going to show you a gameplay approach that's more how I feel the developers intended for it to be played. That's always a bit subjective, of course, but I kind of feel that if you work within the information the developers intended you have, you have a bit more rewarding play, at least at first. And we'll get into that in more in a bit. For now, though, uh, today's video is going to cover mastering the core mechanics of the game. And by core mechanics, I am principally talking about its predictability and then the options that are given to you, the player, as a result of that predictability and how to sort through the best possible responses to the puzzle the game has given you. Now, it's kind of interesting that Into the Breach is almost an entirely reactive game in that there's virtually nothing you can do that determines the type of vec you face or what maps you get or what objectives you roll. You know, there's a little bit of choice when you're selecting one map over another, but ultimately these are kind of foregone conclusions. The good news is we can use that to our advantage. Now, to start mastering into the breach mechanics, we first need to understand that aforementioned predictability. First and foremost, that's understanding the order of events executed on the start of the turn, understanding the deterministic versus random components of each turn, and then lastly, determining the optimal response therein. There are three components to understanding Into the Breach's predictability. They are, first, what happens when we end the turn, second, the order of events, and then lastly, the deterministic versus random components. For understanding what happens when we end the turn, it's important to know that the game gives us all the information we need up front to accurately predict what the state of the game board is going to be at the start of the following turn. As an example here, we know that if I simply hit the end turn button, we would lose grid here, followed by us failing the objective here when the firefly destroys the light tank. We interject our mechs into that event chain in order to disrupt them. Okay, so we understand what happens when we end the turn. The next important part of predictability is understanding the order of events. The game outright tells you exactly what the order of events is. In this case, we can see that the scarab is going to fire at the grid, followed by the scion doing nothing, and then lastly, the firefly attacking the tank. Generally speaking, the order of events is that you have environmental damage, which is followed by special scion moves, which is followed by individual enemy actions, which is followed by enemies emerging, and then lastly, guess. We don't have environmental damage or uh, guess or a special scion move, so you don't see them here, but the important part is, is that they do show up in this list if you happen to have them. The action always follows the order of spawn, which is why on the uh, maps at the end of the island, you notice that the leader always goes first because they are spawned first. And so the last effect to emerge will always be the last to act. And what I like to do as a trick, especially when the board starts to get really busy, is think of the event turn order as shorthand for how many vec I have to care about before I care about this one. In this case, we see that the Firefly is number three, so I know that there's two actions before him that I need to care about. It also tells us in what way the vec can be manipulated, knowing that one goes before another. Um, ultimately, though, uh, for this example, we'll simply stick to the fact we know that the Scarab goes first, followed by the Scion, and then lastly, the Firefly. The last part of understanding predictability is being able to sort out what's deterministic and what's random. We know that our actions are deterministic. If we move our Prime to this location and attack the Scarab, the Scarab takes two damage and gets pushed onto the emerging Vectile. We know that if we allow the Firefly to shoot, it's going to destroy the light tank because it will do one damage and the tank only has one health. There are a number of components which are random, however, and we need to pay attention to those to understand how to best mitigate them. The two most important examples 
here are whether or not a grid will resist an attack. That is entirely random. We can't know that in advance. And second, what vec are going to emerge from a spawn? Again, we can't know that in advance, with a little bit of exception. For instance, the game will not spawn two scions. However, uh, generally speaking, we don't know what vec are going to emerge. There are some other random components as well. For instance, when you kill a blob and it splits, where those blobs land, that is pseudo-random. Additionally, and perhaps most importantly, what action the VEC is going to take on the start of the following turn, while well, you're going to get a chance to mitigate that, you do not know in advance what actions they are going to take. With the information we have so far, we have a base understanding of the predictability in the game, and we know that our primary objective is to avoid grid damage. Let's put that information to use and look at one possible solution to this puzzle that relies only on the information we've discussed so far and see what happens. All right, so what happened? We had one vet killed, one vet blocked, one vec wounded, and then one vec about to emerge. Now, obviously, that wasn't an optimal solution to the puzzle. There's nothing particularly wrong with it in that we still managed to survive the turn and didn't take any grid damage, but certainly optimizations can be made. So let's go over some of those optimizations, and we'll start with considering what our possible responses should be in any given situation. Basically, the possible responses to any given puzzle boil down to preventing grid or objective loss, uh, blocking or killing VEC, and then lastly, preventing mech damage. That also tends to be the priority in which you'd want to go after them as well, and we'll get into some uh, more details in a minute here. Now, first, let's look at preventing grid or objective loss. We know that only grid damage affects the outcome of the score. However, we also know that objectives cannot be repaired at the end of an island. So if, say, you're going for objectives over grid, you would obviously prioritize that. Generally speaking, though, when you're trying to go for high-level play, you want to always sort by grid damage first. As an example opener here, you would see that this move definitely prevents grid damage as well as preventing objective destruction. The caveat there is, of course, that we end up taking damage on our prime here if we are dumb and don't actually move him. That's important to actually consider, though, because hit points are a freely consumable resource and should be considered part of the ways you can mitigate VEC actions. Now, quite obviously, killing a VEC is going to be more optimal than letting it damage you if you can avoid it. And so one very obvious optimization here is to move the prime down, fire at the emerging vectile, which disposes of the firefly as well as weakening the scarab enough for the prime to finish it off. We want to do that before we push the scion, of course, because as you see in the silhouette, the tile in which the scion ultimately ends up is going to get pushed now. If we do that prior, then when we end up firing here, the scion gets pushed into the water and we've accomplished nothing. The important notes there are, though, is that killing is usually the optimal move, though not always, and I'll give you an example very soon on why killing is not always optimal. Your hit points, just like your actions, are consumable resources. Blocking is always more optimal than damaging, and lastly, blocking on turn 3 is as optimal as killing. The specifics of that are because on the last turn, Novak emerge, and therefore, having blocked the prior turn, it's essentially killing the Vec. So if we try that same scenario again, using that prioritization of killing is usually optimal, hit points are a consumable resource, blocking is more optimal than just damaging, we can probably improve things. So let's give it a go. All right, so what happened there? 
same starting scenario, but in this case, we killed two VEC, we blocked one VEC, and we have one VEC emerging. Additionally, the Scion will get killed when it blocks the emerging VEC. That's clearly more optimal than our first strategy, though in both, neither grid was damaged nor were objectives failed. Now let's go over another possible response, one that I would consider most optimal, even though we actually end up leaving a VEC alive. The last step in mastering the basic mechanics of the game comes down to basically uh, two components. First is understanding that you are trading actions for actions with every turn. And then second, you need to look for which actions act as a force multiplier. To understand trading actions for actions, we'll go back to the start of our game board. A player is typically given three actions to deal with, and those three actions need to counter some number of VEC actions. Usually that some number is higher than three, in a sense you're always outnumbered. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean direct VEC actions, that includes emerging VEC, which we'll get into in a minute. But generally speaking, you need to counter more than one VEC action for every action that you take. To illustrate that, let's add up the number of actions the VEC get on this first turn of this first island. We have one Prime and one Scarab, there's one to one. We have the Ardy and the Firefly, there's two to two. We have the Tank and the Scion, there's three to three. Yes, I know it's a Scion, but imagine that it's anything else. And there you might think is three to three actions, but really? We've also got the emerging VEC to consider. There's actually five actions the VEC are going to take when we end our turn. We ideally need to counter more than one action, and the optimal solution here would be countering five by expending three. Knowing that we need to counter five actions for three means we need to be looking for those actions which are force multipliers. An obvious force multiplier here would be to push the Scion onto the emerging VEC spawn. That kills the Scion, and it also prevents a VEC from emerging. That's clearly a 1-2 to two action return. Pushing the Scarab onto E2 is also another obvious force multiplier, except then, of course, the Scarab is still going to be free to damage Grid, as it's going to act before the emerging VEC pops up and kills it. But what if we leverage the increased damage from push when there's an object behind a VEC? By using the RD to shove the Firefly onto E2, we provide an opportunity for the Prime to outright kill the Scarab, and the Firefly is left in place to block afterward. This solution has positives and negatives compared to the one we just looked at, but before we discuss those, why don't we actually see what that optimal solution would look like? All right, so what happened there? We only killed one VEC, but we have zero VEC emerging. So which one is optimal? Now, my opinion is that the second solution is more optimal. The reason for that comes down to randomness. Scenario one leaves you with one unknown VEC with an unknown number of hit points. It could be a Hornet that moves to a position on the map that you can't control. It could be an Alpha, which likewise you might not be able to kill. Scenario 2 leaves you with one known VEC with one hit point, therefore it's not much of a threat. Either solution could be valid. I tend towards the solutions which reduce randomness rather than increase it. Therefore, to me, Scenario 2 is optimal. To wrap this all up, mastery of these basic mechanics looks as follows. First, we understand predictability, which means we know what happens, in what order, and we know what we don't know. Second, we apply that knowledge to consider a response. We want to sort grid damage first. Killing is greater than blocking is greater than damage as optimal. That's not always the case, but it's a good rule. And then turn three blocking is functionally killing. And lastly, we iterate on that response to optimize by understanding we are trading actions for actions. We should prioritize force multipliers and emerging VEC should count as actions.
And that'll wrap it up for this video. Thank you everyone who watched. If you have any suggestions or comments, please leave them down below. And I hope to see you next time. Thank you.